To me, the NRA is an organization that's helping to preserve my rights. They're the front runners, they're the ones that are taking the most heat. They're not giving up on our gun rights. The NRA, known as a defender for gun rights and a leader in firearm education, is mired in controversy. Never in the history of the NRA have so many powerful forces attacked us on so many different fronts. Claims of financial wrongdoing, which the NRA has denied, have led to multiple investigations in Congress and in New York State that are threatening the group's survival. I think the NRA really is in existential danger right now because of the many forces that have converged to bring it down. The NRA says it's facing financial ruin and claims it may soon be unable to exist as a not-for-profit organization. In a lawsuit targeting Governor Andrew Cuomo and New York State regulators, the gun group said that New York could cause irrecoverable loss and irreparable harm to the organization. But is the NRA crying wolf? Or, with multiple ongoing investigations, could its future actually be in jeopardy? With falling revenue, political infighting, and several major scandals on the horizon, is this the end of the NRA? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this year's NRA ILA Leadership Forum. The National Rifle Association was started in 1871 by a group of former Union Army officers. Through most of the 20th century, the NRA was known primarily for promoting firearm safety. The group even backed the nation's first federal gun laws after the Prohibition era. But in the 1970s, the NRA reversed course. The NRA took a hard turn to the right in 1977 when a dissident faction took control of the organization. And it was that trajectory that put the NRA on the path to where it is today. In 1980, the group gave its first ever presidential endorsement to Ronald Reagan. And in the 90s and 2000s, the NRA continued its shift to the right. For everyone within the sound of my voice, to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. In the election of 2000 is when the NRA really began to flex some political muscle, because they got heavily involved in the presidential election. Charlton Heston went on tour in some critical states. In the 2010 midterm elections, near the peak of its influence, the NRA spent millions and supported dozens of candidates. Of the candidates it spent money on, about 60% won. But money may not be the key to the NRA's success. The real power of the NRA doesn't lie in its finances. The real power of the NRA lies in its membership. By 2013, the group was spending over $3 million a year on lobbying, a fraction of the organization's total spending. But with an army of highly motivated supporters, it turned the NRA into a major political force in Washington. With nearly 5 million members as of August 2019, the NRA is a leader in firearm education. It has over 100,000 certified instructors, now training about a million gun owners a year. I think of the NRA as a group of people who are concerned about sports shooting and concerned about self-defense. The NRA is a nonprofit with a revenue of $312 million in 2017, according to its most recent public filings. The money comes mainly from membership fees, private contributions, and funding from large corporations, many within the gun industry. In 2008 and 2012, the group spent $21 million opposing Democrat Barack Obama and supporting Republicans John McCain and Mitt Romney. But it was in the 2016 election that the NRA took a massive gamble, placing a $54 million bet on Donald Trump and protecting Republican majorities in Congress. The victory was a huge win for the NRA, giving it allies on Capitol Hill and the White House political clout it hadn't seen in a decade. Please welcome the 45th president of the United States of America, Donald Trump. But more legislative influence on Capitol Hill and in the Oval Office came at a big cost. The NRA spending ballooned by more than $100 million in 2016. While the group did have some money problems in the 1990s, 2016 proved to be a devastating blow to its finances. The NRA reported a staggering $46 million loss, a significant drop from income of $33 million in 2015. And with a pro-gun administration in the White House, membership started to lag. Membership revenue fell 21% to $128 million in 2017. But this trend isn't new. Almost always when a Republican president is in office, 
the NRA experiences a drop in donations and dues. And conversely, when Democrats are in power, people re-up their membership. If a Democrat wins, now suddenly it's like, whoa, this could happen. And now, hey, I've got to buy weapons because they may not be around. Gun sales spike, but also it means contributions to the NRA and membership to the NRA is going to increase because now I really have to be vigilant with regard to my rights. The NRA has very effectively marketed these instances of Democratic candidate winning the White House as existential threat, not just for the organization, but for Second Amendment rights. They have masterfully taken advantage of these opportunities to grow their membership and grow their financial support. The NRA also tends to see spikes in money and membership dues following mass shootings and the subsequent gun control debates. For example, in 2013, Dues collected by NRA members increased by 62% over the previous year following the killings of 20 children and 6 adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in late 2012. In December of 2012, ironically spurred not only an increase in gun sales, but also more people sending money to the NRA as a way of expressing their political feeling that the federal government moving to enact stronger gun laws was not the appropriate thing to do. The group insists the root of the problem is not the guns. We have repeatedly offered real solutions that have proven to work. Put trained armed security in every school. Fix the broken mental health care system. Enforce the federal gun laws. In the weeks following the February 2018 Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Parkland, Florida that left 17 people dead, the NRA's political victory fund saw donations triple. But according to analysts, the gun group's finances may not be the real source of its influence. Most of the NRA's real power comes from its legion of foot soldiers. You cannot turn out hundreds of supporters of Microsoft at a congressional town meeting in upstate New York. The NRA membership and sympathizers are people who will mobilize on behalf of the gun cause. They'll vote based on the gun issue. They'll go to a demonstration, things that most Americans don't do. For us, it's an important organization because they are preserving our gun rights and they are helping to preserve the future of the Second Amendment. I'm a certified NRA instructor. I started getting into shooting in general about 12 years ago. I was in a bad relationship when I was in college and then after I got out, I kind of really try to get myself back together. Visualize your target, support wrist forward. As long as you're solid and you have a good control, they're gonna go where you want them. I will continue to support the NRA and I will continue to do my part as far as what I can do on local legislation and what I can do on my state level and city level. Good. We're all in this fight together. The gun industry in the U.S. is a $52 billion business. That includes manufacturers and retailers of guns, ammunition, and accessories. Even though the industry is the biggest it's ever been, there appear to be fewer gun owners. In 1994, 51% of households in the U.S. reported having a gun in their home. By 2018, that number was down to 43%. A smaller number of people are buying guns, but they're buying more guns. Where someone used to own three or four guns, it may not be uncommon now for somebody to own a dozen or 15 or 20 different guns. Firearm production in the U.S. was stagnant through the 80s and 90s, but in the last decade, that's changed dramatically. An assault weapons ban signed by President Clinton in 1994 outlawed the AR-15 and other similar semi-automatic rifles. But after the ban expired in 2004, Gun makers reintroduced the weapons and sales took off. In the past several decades, there has been a shift in terms of the types of firearms that people have been buying. From handguns, from revolvers, to pistols, virtually all of which are semi-automatics. And in long guns, there's been a shift from hunting rifles to AR-style rifles, or what the industry calls modern sporting rifles, what people outside of the industry refer to as assault rifles. There are about 16 million AR-15-style weapons in the U.S., and in 2016, the gun industry sold more than 2 million, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation. These days, there are roughly 30 gun companies that make some version of what we would identify as an assault rifle or more broadly assault weapons. There are many different models, different styles. It's a weapon that is quite accessorizable. Described in some gun circles as a Barbie doll for men for the almost infinite number of accessories, gun makers can make even more money selling everything from laser sights to magnifier scopes that can be attached to the weapon. 
And just like with donations to the NRA, gunmakers have seen sales grow when a Democrat moves into the White House. When Barack Obama won in 2008 and again when he was reelected, there's immediately a spike in sales of firearms because there's a fear that firearms will be taken away. And it often becomes panic buying. There was a period of time when there was a shortage of firearms, shortage of ammunition, where you really literally could not find it. And I say to people very often, one of the best gun salesmen in the history of the United States was President Obama. With the Trump presidency, we've seen a reverse phenomenon. After Trump's election, gun sales have plummeted. And as a consequence, the gun industry has been taking it on the chin during the Trump administration. And in fact, it's been referred to as the Trump slump. And I'm a champion for the Second Amendment, and so are you. It's not going anywhere. The Trump slump hasn't been good for the gun industry. U.S. firearm sales fell 6% in 2018, marking the second straight year of declines. In 2018, U.S. firearm sales were estimated at 13 million, down from a record 16 million in 2016, according to the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Those losses and mounting public pressure for more gun control have had a large impact on some of the biggest gun makers. There are dozens of companies that produce firearms, and while many are privately held, a few disclose some of their financials. Sturm Ruger & Company, one of the biggest U.S. gun manufacturers, had firearm sales of $490 million in 2018, down 25 percent from 2016. American Outdoor Brands, the owner of Smith & Wesson, another top manufacturer that's been in business since 1852, had sales of $600 million in 2018, down 16 percent from 2016. Remington, a privately held company and America's oldest gun maker, was briefly in Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the spring of 2018 amid falling sales and mounting pressure for gun control. Falling sales could be hurting the gun industry's ability to give money to the NRA. In 2016, Sturm Ruger & Company announced a promotional campaign in which it donated $2 of every new firearm purchase to the gun group. The company paid the NRA $1.5 million in 2017 and 2018, more than six times less than it gave in 2015 and 2016. Money may be at the center of the NRA's current problems, but it's internal squabbling that got them there. I think we're somewhere between this is business as usual versus an existential crisis or cataclysmic event. At their annual meeting in April 2019, a power struggle broke out between NRA Chief Executive Wayne LaPierre and NRA President Oliver North. North was ousted. LaPierre, who earns over a million dollars a year, was accused of making $275,000 worth of purchases at a men's luxury store in Beverly Hills, according to an email sent by the group's advertising agency, Ackerman McQueen. Around the same time it became known, North was allegedly paid about a million dollars a year through Ackerman McQueen, according to interviews with NRA supporters by The New Yorker and The Trace, a nonpartisan, nonprofit newsroom that looks at gun violence in the U.S. Those scandals and others have led to a slew of investigations. In April 2019, the New York State Attorney General launched an investigation claiming NRA officials mismanaged the group's money, putting its nonprofit status on the line. CNBC reached out to the New York Attorney General's office, and as a matter of policy, it was unable to confirm or deny whether an investigation is ongoing. The NRA said in an email to CNBC, the NRA will cooperate with any appropriate inquiry into its finances. The NRA has full confidence in its accounting practices. A separate investigation in 2017 by the New York Department of Financial Services found the NRA Carry Guard Insurance Program unlawfully provided liability insurance to gun owners in the event of a self-defense shooting. The program widely promoted by the NRA was dubbed murder insurance by critics. According to the New York governor's office, the NRA does not have a license to conduct insurance business in the state. In a countersuit, the NRA said Andrew Cuomo has criticized the political speech and influence of Second Amendment types generally and the NRA specifically for decades. Moreover, Cuomo has a history of abusing his regulatory power to retaliate against his political opponents on gun control issues. In an email to CNBC, the NRA said government officials can express viewpoints on matters of public concern but when the state crosses the line from persuasion to coercion, the First Amendment comes into play. Congress has also been scrutinizing the group's finances, and in July 2019, the Attorney General for Washington, D.C. issued subpoenas to the NRA and its charitable foundation amid allegations of financial misconduct. 
and the gun group is dealing with the fallout from Russian operative Maria Butina, who was sentenced to 18 months in prison in April 2019. Butina allegedly used her NRA activism to illegally infiltrate conservative political circles. In response to their internal troubles, the NRA cut ties with its top lobbyists, split with its estranged PR firm Ackerman McQueen, and shut down production of NRA TV. Despite the NRA's attempt at damage control, those investigations could still have serious implications for the group. If the NRA lost its nonprofit status, it could have a major, major impact on their future activities, severely restricting and hobbling what they are able to do. But what does all this mean for the future of the NRA? And is bankruptcy imminent? The NRA's position right now is about as bad as it has ever been, at least in modern times. All of this is coming together to be the perfect storm. And the gun group is facing additional pressure on a national level. As of 2018, 6 in 10 U.S. adults say gun laws should be more strict, 12% more than 2008. I would expect fallout in terms of declining revenues. I would expect fallout in terms of declining membership. Is this the end of the NRA? I think the answer to that is no. As one of these organizers put it, the NRA existed long before Wayne LaPierre was in charge, and the NRA will exist long after Wayne LaPierre is gone. We are always scared about the future of the Second Amendment and the future of our gun rights. If somebody is a law-abiding citizen, then they have that right to protect themselves, and that's what we want to keep. Despite ongoing litigation and fears of even bigger money problems, the NRA has built a movement convincing supporters that gun ownership is a right that must be defended daily. And that operation could prove to be the financial lifeline the group needs.